So this week, I went and I checked my mailbox in the lobby, and, and I found something fascinating. There was a magazine with this on the cover. It, it's a, a catalog with materials for uh, a church, right? And, and one of the specific things that said for Christmas coming up is you could, for there was a price with advertising across there for $179, I could get this robe, and our, at our Christmas services, I could have the whole nativity on the front of me. Wouldn't this be incredible? I don't know if anybody wants to donate to this. But here's the question for you is, what does holiness look like? What does closeness to Jesus look like? I looked a little bit more through this catalog and I found that there were also special shirts that are especially for pastors to wear. And maybe if I wore that, people would expect that I had a special word from God. Well, or maybe if I wore something else. What exactly does holiness closeness to God, what does this look like? And how do I go and, and find the closeness to God? Is there some place that I maybe could go and travel to in order to, to get closer to God? You know, I actually went to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and I stood right there, and, you know, another pastor and I, we were trying to figure out, okay, so where exactly would the most holy place have been? we got to get a selfie right by the most holy place. And we were trying to figure out exactly where that would have been, it's a desolate place, just like was prophesied. Uh, there is the Dome of the Rock there, a mosque there. There's actually another mosque, which is a holier mosque to Muslims. Was I closer to God's presence there? Am I closer to God's presence when I'm here in church than when I am at home in my bedroom? What does it look like to come near to God? You know, when we go out on our Thursday morning outreaches, it's kind of funny. There's, there's two pastors uh, that go out. I recently invited Roger Patton to join us. He's a Presbyterian church pastor here in Templeton, new pastor in the area. And as we go from place to place, Bob, who's the fearless leader there in the middle, he'll say, hey guys, today, when we get to one camp, at the end of our conversation, we always pray for them. He said, today we have something special. We have two pastors here, and they have a direct line to God. I'm trying to break him of that habit. I'm like, everybody has a direct line to God. Everybody can communicate with God. Everybody can come to him and pray. But is there something special about the pastor that he suddenly has a closer walk with God? I definitely want to walk as close as possible with God. What does closeness, nearness to Jesus look like? You know, as I think about the series we've been doing in the life of Daniel. I think that Daniel exemplifies closeness to God. How about you? We start in Daniel chapter 1. He purposes in his heart not to defile himself with the king's food because of the idolatry represented there, because of the misrepresentation of Jesus. Chapter 2. He saves all of the wise men's lives because he and his friends go and they pray and they re he receives a night vision that reveals to him the future. Or, well, really, it reveals to him the, the, the Nebuchadnezzar's dream. A few other things. The, notice how that was Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but he got a vision to help interpret it. The next chapter, chapter 3, tells us that he's... Not even there, but his three friends have this incredible experience, and the Son of God shows up in a fiery furnace to rescue his three friends. Chapter 4, we find Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. Daniel is once again given the ability to interpret this dream, and Nebuchadnezzar is converted, and we have a tyrant, pagan king who writes a chapter in the Bible because he's been converted. Then we have chapter 5, where Daniel interprets the handwriting on the wall, where we have another pagan tyrant king who does not repent. Then chapter 6, we find Daniel so intent on his relationship with God that when the pressures come to him, he refuses to stop his three times daily opening the window and going to God in prayer. Then we have chapter 7 to 9, which we have just concluded now, it's not somebody else that's having a dream. It's not Daniel interpreting somebody else's dream. But now, Daniel is having visions. He's having dreams. And he's getting visited by Gabriel, who goes later to Mary, who we know stands at the right hand of the Father, this angel who is so close to the very presence of God. 
There's like this progression in the life of Daniel of closeness to God. And we are going to see the climax of it this morning. Are you excited? I'm excited. I am excited to find out what we're going to find in Daniel chapter 10. So I invite you to take your Bible and open up to Daniel chapter 10. If you don't have your Bible, we'll follow, just follow along on the screen. And we're going to start in Daniel chapter 10. We're going to see what this experience that Daniel has with God looks like. Daniel chapter 10, starting in verse 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. Now we are at the latest date in the life of Daniel. This is the only time in the book of Daniel that a year is dated based upon Cyrus. Remember, Cyrus was the one who overthrew Babylon. He was the general under uh, Darius. And Darius was king for a couple of years. And now Cyrus has been king for three years. What does that mean? It means Daniel, who was taken captive about the age of 18, is about 88 years old. He's in his upper 80s. He's almost 90 years old. You've seen somebody like that before? You know, they have walked with God for so long. I just want to sit with them and talk with them about Jesus. I want to, I want to know what it is that, that has helped them to have such a close walk with Jesus for so long many years. He's almost 90 years old. We sometimes lose the picture of this man towards the end of his life here in the third year of Cyrus. But he's still continuing to serve. Now he's in Cyrus's court and he's serving at, at the top of that court. Verse 2 In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. He's in mourning. One of the reasons that's possible is the fact that the Israelites had been sent back to rebuild the temple. They haven't yet been given permission to build the city, but they've been given permission to rebuild the temple. But in have come the Samaritans and other enemies, and they have begun to, to bother the Israelites as they're trying to build the temple and try to stop them and send messages back to Babylon to stop them from rebuilding the temple. And Daniel is in mourning. He's also received some visions that give him this long, expansive picture of what is coming until Messiah, like we looked at last week. That Jesus is the center of it all, but that time period was 490 years. And then there's the 2300 years. And he's trying to understand this, we'll see in just a minute in this passage. He's grappling with this. And, and in order for this 490 years even to start, there's got to be a decree that all of Jerusalem can be rebuilt, and this hasn't come yet. Maybe these are some of the things that have led Daniel to be in mourning, and for mourning for three full weeks. Have you prayed for something and wondered why God isn't answering? You pray day in and day out. You pray earnestly and wonder, is God even listening? Why am I not getting an answer? Look at how he's fasting in this time. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth. He decided to be a vegetarian during this time again. He decided to not eat pleasant food during this time. He's fasting from specific things. Fast doesn't always mean no uh, food whatsoever and just water. It can mean that I'm just, just uh, holding back on a few things. Nor did I anoint myself at all. Some of the comforts he was avoiding. Until three whole weeks were fulfilled. He's in earnest about this. Now, on the 24th day of the first month, as I was by the sign of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man, clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Ufaz. He's there by the river, and suddenly he looks and he sees a figure who's clothed in linen, and this figure, the first thing he tells us about him is he's girded with gold. Gold. Something that is so precious to us because it's incorruptible. It shines so beautifully. We like to, to have it because of its value. It's a, an attractiveness to gold. Something that draws us in. And this character has gold that it is girded, he is girded with. His body was like burrow. I had to look that one up. Burrow. What, it, what exactly is that? Well, on Wikipedia, you find that there are different colors of burrow. There's an aqua color of it. There's an emerald color of it. Um, but some people think that maybe this isn't burl, maybe it's topaz, a blue color, whatever it is. The picture is that as Daniel is looking at this figure, he's attractive. Isn't that why we have gems and beautiful things that are decorated? The desire is to attract attention, and people will travel from all over. In fact, I know some people today who told me, I'm going today to a rock and gem show. 
because they want to go and see these beautiful rocks, these beautiful gems. There's something attractive, something beautiful about these precious stones, and this is what Daniel wants to describe to us using the biggest symbols, the most beautiful symbols he can come up with is this figure is attractive. He's, he's pulling me in. His face was, his body was like girl. His face like the appearance of lightning. Have you ever uh, been on a, a beautiful evening where there is tons of lightning? Lee and I used to, in our back bedroom in Michigan, we had a lot of lightning storms. And I'll tell you, when you're in a safe building, and you know that it's safe, and you have a nice window there, it is so much fun to just sit by the, the window and watch the lightning. So to watch the night sky light up. You know, when somebody walks into a room and there's something, uh, there's something charismatic about them, we tend to, to say, they just light up the room. You heard somebody say that before? They, that person, they just light up the room when they walk in. The picture here is of, of his face. It's like, it's, it's bright as lightning. It's, it's lighting up the place. And this, again, is an attractive picture that's designed to pull us in. Face like the appearance of lightning in his eyes, like torches of fire. Fire? Can fire be attractive? Well, have you ever gone camping before? Where does everybody hang out when you're camping? Everybody goes and they sit around the fire, and it, you know, you're all sitting there, and, and everybody for hours on end is just looking into the, the gloomy universe, telling stories, and singing songs. There's just something beautiful and attractive about fire as it's burning. You know, my grandmother loved fire so much that in her later years, she wasn't able to have an actual fireplace. She lived in Florida. I don't even think they put fireplaces in homes in Florida for good reason. But she got a fake fireplace that had flames that would light up, and she would sit there on her chair and just watch the fake flames flicker. There's something beautiful about looking into a fire. Well, this being's eyes were like torches of fire. And it says his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color. What is that talking about? Well, we could look at the, the metal bronze, but as you think about it, when we say that somebody is bronze, maybe we picture somebody like this with their arms that are strong and tan, or maybe legs that are extremely strong, feet that are extremely strong. The picture here is of strength, and power, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. Now, I don't know anybody like this, but have you ever heard somebody with a really measly voice and you just don't really want to listen to them because they just have this kind of annoying, measly voice? I'm not talking about anybody here there, or anybody that I know, but I don't know anybody like that. Right? This is not that kind of voice. This is the voice. The sound of the words are like the voice of a multitude. Where's Paul Robin? Uh, where is he when we need him? <laughs> when he reads the scripture, you can tell that Paul is in the room. <laughs> because there's a deep, booming voice. He had the voice of a multitude. So, so who is this? Who just showed up to Daniel? Well, let's look. Daniel chapter 10 parallels another figure who is about 90 years of age, who is also greatly beloved by God, who is also in captivity on an island called Patmos. And the very first thing in his vision, or in the first chapter of his vision, Revelation chapter 1, watch this. Daniel chapter 10, we found that the figure was girded with gold, and we find that there's a figure that shows up to John, the beloved disciple, that is girded with gold. Then we find that we saw that he had a face like lightning. Well, this figure's countenance is shining like the sun. A beautiful picture. You know, we love to go out on the sun. Made again, an attractive picture to draw us in. Eyes like torches of fire. Oh, again, in verse 14 of Revelation 1, this figure has eyes like a flame of fire. Feet like bronze, feet like brass. Voice of a multitude, voice like many waters. Can you see the parallels here? Can you see the similarities? And who is this figure in Revelation chapter 1? It tells us that he's one like the Son of Man, but it goes on to tell us this, talking about how he brings a letter to a specific church. In, well, first of all, but John also fell on his face just like Daniel is about to fall on his face. 
He fell at his feet as dead, John did. Notice Revelation 2, verse 18. These things says the who? The Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Jesus is the one that John says that he saw. Daniel doesn't define who it is, but the picture is that he is seeing the pre-incarnate Christ. He is seeing the Son of God at almost 90 years of age. It's no longer just Nebuchadnezzar's dream. It's no longer even just a vision that he's having himself, but now he's actually getting to see Jesus. I want to see Jesus. How about you? I want to come in contact with Jesus. I want to know God for who he truly is is revealed in Jesus. Well, notice what happens when Jesus is revealed. Verse 7 of chapter 10. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Wait a second. I thought you just unpacked this as being really attractive. They don't even want to see this vision. They're running and they're hiding. Revelation chapter 6, at the end of the chapter, it tells us that when the Son of God comes seated on his throne, that people will be running and hiding and crying for the rocks and the caves. Uh, the rocks that fall on them will be hiding in caves. And they'll say, hide us from the face of the Lamb. The Lamb, the one who lay down his life for them. They don't understand his goodness. They don't understand his love. Just like Adam and Eve in the garden, what was it as God came walking in the cool of the day? Adam and Eve are running and they're hiding behind bushes because they're afraid of what God is going to do to them. He's come to give them the promise that he's going to lay down his own life for them. And they're busy hiding because they're so focused on their sin and they don't see the forgiveness that there is in God. So these individuals are running and hiding. But what about Daniel? How does Daniel react when he gets to come into the presence of God himself? Verse 8, Therefore I was left alone when I saw this great vision, and no strength remained in me. For my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I retained no strength. Do you want to know what holiness looks like? Do you want to know what closeness to Jesus looks like? It, it's not the guy who says, I've got the Christian walk all figured out. I can handle it. It's the 90-year-old man who's willing to go to the lion's den rather than to stop praying, who when he comes in contact with Jesus says, I've got nothing. I've got no strength. He says, my vigor was turned to frailty. Really, it could be his splendor was turned to Corruption. Daniel, the one that, as we go through the book of Daniel, there's not one time where there is an explicit reference to something that he did wrong. And in the Bible, you know if you've read the Bible, that that's a pretty amazing thing. The Bible holds no punches on characters. But this guy, we have no record that he's done anything wrong. But when he's in the presence of Jesus, he's not there to say, wow, I lived a really good life. I kept all the commandments. I did the right thing. He's there saying, I've got no strength. There is nothing left. I am undone. My vigor turned to frailty. My splendor to corruption. I retain no strength. I have no strength left. Well, what happens? Oh, great controversy. First of all, page 471 talks about how this describes the experience of all who, who truly come to a place of holiness. It says, those who live nearest to Jesus discern most clearly the frailty and sinfulness of humanity. And their only hope is in the merit of a crucified and risen Savior. Hallelujah! If you look in the mirror and say, oh, I've been walking with God so long and I don't even know when I look in the mirror if I'm a Christian. The nearer you come to Jesus, the more you'll recognize your frailty and your sinfulness. Don't expect that one day you're going to wake up and say, I finally arrived. I fixed all my problems and now I'm ready for translation. The reality is there is no place in the Bible that gives us a picture that you will ever recognize that you have come to that place. 
but it does picture that we will come to recognize so completely, so fully, that there is no strength in you, that I am complete in Jesus, in Jesus' strength only. But notice, he's got absolutely no strength. His splendor has turned to corruption. How does heaven respond to that? Yet I heard the sound of his words. I, I heard his words, and when I heard his words, something took place. While I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. You know, I used to read that and think, okay, it's just getting worse for the guy. And then I had kids. And I'll tell you, just this last week, I think Nathan's teething or what, something like that. We're not getting as much sleep as we should be. And I just told Leah yesterday, I said, I had, I fell asleep. And when I woke up, I literally wished, was hoping that I could sleep for days. I thought, this feels so incredibly good. Daniel's got no strength whatsoever. What does he need more than anything? To fall into a deep sleep. And when the word of God comes to him, when he hears that voice, we're not sure if it's which voice it is, but when he hears a voice from heaven, he's put into a deep sleep. Friend, if you're wanting peace in your life, if you're wanting hope in your life, if you're wanting to come in contact with Jesus, it's by listening to his words, by sitting at his feet, day in and day out. That's the only thing that keeps me going. As a pastor, I would give up if it were not for the promises of God. There's too much discouragement, too many life situations, too many people going through it, and I can't solve it all, but I know Jesus from this book, and it changes everything. You know, on that trip to Israel, I can't pinpoint, you know, we went to the, the Church of the Nativity, and they, they like to have you touch right where probably not really, but they think that the crib was, or the, 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 uh, the manger for Jesus. They like to take you to the exact place. Well, this is probably where the cross was. And there's an amazing, like, conglomerate church there. Multiple churches all compiled there. And they feel like it's such a holy spot. But you know the place of my entire trip? And I said, I feel the presence of Jesus like I've never felt it before. It was sitting by the Sea of Galilee, something like five or six in the morning, looking out over the Sea of Galilee, and listening to the voice of Jesus. I said, I can get this every morning in my own room. It's something special about looking at the Sea of Galilee and picturing it, but, but really, truly, every day, I can come in contact with the living word. I can hear his voice and be given rest. Jesus says, come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart. You want to know what holiness looks like? It looks like meekness. It looks like lowliness. It looks like humility. Daniel is not the one who's there saying, okay, let me point out all the problems that there are in my people. He is confessing sins with them. And when he comes in contact with God, he's on his face saying, we've got nothing. I've got nothing. He's the righteous man. So we continue verse 10. And behold, a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. Right, so now he's gone from face down to now he's a little bit higher. He's on his hands and his knees, but he's still what? Trembling. He's trembling on his hands and knees. So the response is, and he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved. Heaven sees one of their children there. He's on his hands and knees. He's trembling. And heaven says, you are greatly beloved. Just like he showed up to Daniel as he confessed and wanted forgiveness. He showed up to say, Heaven loves you, Daniel. Friends, you are greatly beloved. And that changes everything. These are the types of words that you need to find in the Bible. There are people that read the Bible and do not come up with rest in Christ. Because they don't read looking for Jesus and his love. Understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright. Come up from your prone position to now stand upright. He's inviting him a little bit higher. For I have now been sent to you. When he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Now he's finally standing up, but he's still shaking. <laughs> he's still filled with fear. He's gone from face down to on his knees, trembling each step of the way. And now finally he's standing up, trembling. So how does heaven respond? Then he said to me, do 
not fear, Daniel. Time and time again in the Bible, when God shows up, when angels show up, the things that God says is, don't be afraid. Jesus shows up after the resurrection of the disciples. They're cowering in the upper room, and he says, don't be afraid. Peace be to you. Don't be afraid, Daniel. Do not fear. For from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard. Why shouldn't you be afraid? Because he should know that heaven is on his side, that God is his judge. And the second that you started praying, Daniel, you wondered why you've been praying for three weeks and wondered, where is the answer to this? The second that you started praying, what does it say? You were heard. Heaven heard. Heaven's on your side. Daniel, I want you to know that, that heaven is responding to your prayer. Notice what it goes on to say. And I have come because of your words. Gabriel, the one who's at the right hand of the Father, he could have sent any of his multitude of angels. But here's Daniel praying. He says, send Gabriel. Friends, when you pray, angels fly. Things happen. But why three weeks? Why did it take so long if an angel is flying right away? Verse 13 continues, But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. Now the New Testament tells us that Satan is the prince of this world. So we see here a spiritual battle going on, but it's likely going on for the actual prince of the kingdom of Persia, for Cambyses, Cyrus' son. That's one possibility. We're not sure exactly what's going on here, but the angel wants us to know that there's free will on this planet. And we see chaos, we see things going on, we see mass shootings, we see fires, we see people getting hurt by other people. And everyone has their freedom to choose. But the picture is that the angels are proactive when we pray in trying to solve these issues. The prince of the kingdom of Persia was still be 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, really it should say, First, or the overseer of the chief princes came to help me, for I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. There's a picture of a great controversy going on, and Gabriel is fighting, and then along comes Michael, and the, the picture is that, that God's doing whatever it takes to answer Daniel's prayer. He wants to do the same for your prayers. And this helps me in my persistence in prayer. I don't persist in prayer because I'm hoping, well, maybe if I pray a different set of words, God will finally hear me. Maybe if I pray a little bit harder, if I fast a little bit more, maybe God will finally hear me. What I'm praying for is for God's will to be done on earth. He wants to do these things on earth. The problem is there's a great controversy. And the king so Persia, they have freedom to choose. Will they let God's people go? Will they let them rebuild Jerusalem? Or will they not? And God's sending his angels to influence, to woo them, to push them in the right direction. And came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision is for the days yet to come. So I've come to give you understanding, Daniel. When he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face toward the ground. All right, so he's standing, he's been trembling. The angel's trying to keep him from trembling, but notice now. Now his face is turned toward the ground, and he is speechless. How does that respond? And suddenly, one having the likeness of the sons of men. Look at how intimate this is. One like the sons of men comes up and touches my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, My Lord, because of the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me. Another turn to this, my pains are too much for me, and I have retained no strength. Daniel's still saying, I don't have anything. This battle is too big for me. I don't have what it takes. Heaven loves to hear that. Heaven loves to respond to that. Notice what the angel says, and he said to me, Oh, man, greatly beloved. This is the third time. Angels keep coming to Daniel, and the thing that they keep repeating to him is, Daniel, you are loved. And you and I need to know that. In the great controversy, when there's a spiritual battle going on, when we are persisting in prayer, we need to know how much we're loved. 
Oh, but Daniel probably already knew how much he was loved. I mean, he needed to progress beyond that. He's 90 years old. He's seen his friends go through a fiery furnace. Don't just talk about the love of God. That's for, that's for, that's for those beginning their faith, right? Daniel needs to hear that he is loved. The one who receives some of the most incredible prophecies in the universe, that ever in the world history, he needed to find out that he was loved. Don't let anybody tell you. Because it is a lie that you have heard enough about the love of God. That it is the greatest reality because God is love. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened. What is he strengthened by? The angel said, fear not, you're greatly beloved, peace to you, be strong, and he's strengthened by it. And then he says, let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. So look at this. Daniel's experience and heaven responds. We see this throughout this passage. You see that he has no strength, vigor, and his vigor has turned to frailty, his splendor to corruption. How does heaven respond? The voice of Jesus puts him to sleep. You've got no strength? Here, I'm going to speak to you. And he falls asleep and he rests. Then he's face down on the ground. How does heaven respond to that? Heaven touches, uh, the messenger touches him and sets him up on his hands and knees. Pulls him up off of his face. Now he's on his hands and his knees. But now he's on his hands and his knees and he's trembling on his hands and his knees. How does heaven respond? Daniel, get your act together. How many times do I have to tell you you're greatly beloved? I'm here on your behalf. Like, Daniel, stop. When are you going to get it? Look at how persistent God is in revealing his love. You are greatly beloved. Understand, stand upright. He stands upright, and he's there. Now he's trembling. Fear not. Your words have been heard. I was sent by the way. And he's informed about a spiritual battle that is taking place. As if that weren't enough, though, Daniel is with his face down towards the ground, and he's speechless. He can't even talk. And the angel touches his lips. And then he says, I think we may have skipped over verse 17. He actually says, my sorrows have overwhelmed part of it. He says, my sorrows have overwhelmed me. I have retained no strength. No strength remains in me, he goes on to say. And besides that, he says, there's no breath in me. I can't even breathe. Do you know how many times you breathe today? How many breaths you've taken? The Bible says, in him we live and move and have our being. Not a single breath do I take apart from the loving care of my Father in heaven. Every breath that I take, I can know how much God loves me. He says, I've got no breath in me. I can't even breathe on my own, God. And the messenger touches him and strengthens Daniel. And then he's told, O oh man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be to you. Be strong. Yes, be strong. You're greatly beloved. Don't be afraid. Have peace and be strong in the knowledge that I love you and that you don't have to be afraid because I love you and that you can have peace because I love you. You can be strong in that reality and you can endure to the very end. You know, as we look at this loving character of God, we realize something, that there is no place that we could go to finally arrive where we say, I now have nearness to Jesus. And there's no experience where I can suddenly say, pinpoint something in my life to say, yeah, I finally got it all together. That's actually one of the most dangerous places to be. Where I need to be is recognizing that I have no strength, I don't have what it takes, and I need Jesus. So you know what I really want to tell Bob? I want to tell him, you know what? You may be far closer to Jesus than me. You know why? This is what Bob spends his days doing. And I think it's a little reflection of how heaven operates. This is a picture of him delivering five-gallon water jugs. Uh, and I, this may be a picture of Stacy. Stacy has been living in her car um, for quite some time. Her boyfriend is in jail, and she can't work because she can't really even walk quite. Uh, very well. She can just barely shuffle around. She's not able to, to work. She's been living in her car. But things got worse for Stacy. 
She was in, uh, had the car parked in a place, but the car broke down and she wasn't able to move it anymore. And pretty soon she's being told by the police that you have two weeks to move. And then it's 72 hours to move. And suddenly, everybody is trying to spring into action to help Stacy out. Now, Bob and Aurora, you, I'm on a group text message with this Hope and Faith ministry who's doing a lot in Pastor Robles to help the homeless. And you get a text from Bob saying, hey, can anybody take Stacy for a ride tomorrow from 8 to 10 o'clock and she needs to get to such and such a place? Day in and day out, he's trying to help her. She had lost before this actually her California driver's license. And he took her to the DMV, got a voucher for her, and got her to get her license. She hadn't had it actually since 2017. Then he went and he helped her to get her car registered. And then he went with uh, somebody that volunteered to help with the mechanical work. And he and the other guy worked on her car, knowing they had 72 hours. And if they didn't get this car towed out of there, with that car, uh, would be impounded and that Stacy would no longer be able to have that little bit of lifeline that she had. She'd be living in the riverbed without anything. It's a little glimmer of what Jesus really wants us to be up to. The desire of ages tells us you don't need to travel to Nazareth, to Capernaum, to Jerusalem to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. The footsteps of Jesus, she goes on to say, are by the sick bed. They're in the poor, uh, poor man's house. They're down the alleyways of the street because that's where the one who loves the least of these is spending his time. If I want to find Jesus, I can love the world the way that he loved it. I wanted to close with this quote from the book Education. It's a fascinating picture of advice of how to treat those who are very difficult, those who seem unworthy. Notice this. We live in a hard, unfeeling, uncharitable world. Satan and his confederacy are plying every art to seduce the souls for whom Christ has given his precious life. The Prince of Persia, he withheld me for three weeks. There's a, a battle going on. Paul says in Ephesians 6 that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The reason that prayer is so important is makes a difference in this great controversy. Then he goes on to say this, if we wish to do good to souls, these souls that Jesus has died for, our success with these souls will be in proportion to their belief in, our belief in, and appreciation of them. When I come into contact with somebody, do they think that I believe in what they can become? Do they feel that I actually appreciate them? Or am I just wanting to offload some truth to them so that I feel better about myself? Or do I genuinely care about every detail of their life? Am I genuinely sympathetic and empathetic with what's going on in their life? In proportion to our belief in and appreciation of them. Respect shown to, struggle, to the struggling human soul is the sure means through Christ Jesus of the restoration of the self-respect the man has lost. When I show respect to somebody, they begin to be able to believe that there actually is value in their life. Our advancing ideas of what he, that struggling soul, may become is a help we cannot ourselves fully appreciate. I can't tell you how many times I've had people tell me, you're making such an incredible difference in what you're doing. And I'll say, Wait, what do you mean? Well, you've always been there for me for years. You're there with a call. You're there with a text. You're there with a prayer. I'm like, really? I feel like I should have been there a whole lot more for you. And I feel like you're still struggling. But it makes an incredible difference. That's beyond what we recognize when we're simply there for people in their struggles. We have need of the rich grace of God every hour. Then we will have a rich practical experience. For God is love, and he that dwells in love dwells in God. When I live this way, I'm going to draw closer and closer to Jesus, because his love will become more and more what I'm dwelling in. Give love to them that need it most, the most unfortunate, those who have the most disagreeable temperaments. Do you have any of those in your life? People with disagreeable temperaments? There's a couple of them around. They need our love. Our tenderness. Jesus has a lot of work to do in me. I've got no strength for this. <laughs> Our compassion. 
Those who try our patience need most love. Ah, you mean the one that's the most frustrating to me needs the most love from me? The rough, stubborn, sullen dispositions are the ones who need help the most. That one that is so disagreeable, so frustrating, you just have given them up, needs love the most, needs our help the most. How can they be helped? Only by that love practiced in dealing with them, which Christ practiced in dealing with, the, with them, which Christ revealed to fallen man. Dealing with them in the same way that God dealt with Daniel. He's on his face, face down, no strength, and the angel touches him. He speaks to him. He lifts him up. He encourages him. You're loved. And he's still shaking, he's still trembling, and he's pulling him up just a little bit further, just a little bit further, encouraging, telling him how heaven's on his side, telling him that heaven is answering his prayers, giving him the word of God, telling him he's loved, giving him these promises. It makes all the difference that we don't give up on somebody because they look hopeless to us. Treat some characters as you think they richly deserve, and you will cut off from them the last thread of hope, spoil your influence, and ruin the soul. Will it pay? No, I say no, a hundred times no. Find these souls who need all the help it is possible for you to give them close to a loving, sympathizing, pitying heart, overflowing with Christ-like love, and you will save a soul from death and hide a multitude of sins. Don't treat them like you think they deserve to be treated. What if God did that for me? Have you done it? But so often we say, well, that person doesn't deserve it. They did this, and you know how they spend their money, and do you know? What if God treated me that way? Had we not better try the love process? You know, the love process makes an incredible difference. Stacy, uh, Aurora Williams, who runs Open Faith, came to our Thursday night Bible study, and she came in. She was so excited. She said, today, I got to sit down with Stacy." And I was talking to her for about half an hour. And as I talked to her about what's going on in her life, she said, you guys are different. You don't just toss us stuff. You don't just give us stuff. But you actually come and get to know us. You get to know our stories. You get to know what we're going through. And she said, if, if Bob had, had have given up on me during the heat wave when it was 110 outside and I had no water, if he wasn't bringing me those five-gallon jugs, I don't know where I would be. I would have given up hope. And then she said this crucial thing. She said, you know, I didn't believe that God existed, but I do now. I didn't believe that God existed, but I do now. Maybe that atheist down the street Maybe that person who seems like they don't know God, maybe they need to know his love through me and through you. And maybe that will change their lives forever. I want to just simply ask you these two things. One, take time to get to know the love of God. Let him pursue your love. Don't be like the men who ran away and didn't get to encounter the glory of God. We've got to encounter it to the place where we recognize that we've got no strength. Our righteousness is filthy rags, and Jesus is everything. We're only complete in Him. And then, having recognized that, reflect it to the world around you. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And then He said, Go let your light, you are the light of the world. Go let your light shine, that men may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I want to encourage you just to reflect on those things as you. Sing this song, praying and asking that God would draw, close, draw you closer and closer to his loving heart. Father, help us to know that you are here. Not that to change everything about how we live, as we recognize that we are loved. Father, may this lead us to see that there is no strength in us to produce a righteousness that is like yours. May we realize that we desperately need a Savior. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being so patient with us, for, keep, for how you continue to pick us up and come closer and closer and pick us up and speak to us words of encouragement, give us more promises. You don't give up on us because we don't get it yet, even if we're nine years old and a prophet. Father, thank you for your incredible love. Lord, 
please show us how to treat others the same way. Would you work through us to extend the same grace, the same mercy, the same love to hurting humanity around us? Please guide our footsteps to walk in your footsteps. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.